you know, I, I grew up listening to Metallica. So Metallica is the reason I started playing guitar. Okay, welcome to this prog chat number 13, I believe, and we have a wonderful guest from Australia, a guitar player, a composer, and his name is Tom Pierce, and his project is called Caper Moat. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Now, I'm wondering why you don't go by your name, Tom Pierce. It was a weird thing because I, when I first started writing music, I did actually put a little bit of music out under my own name, but as I was kind of thinking about maybe, you know, trying to take it a little bit more seriously, I just couldn't really decide if I wanted to put music out under my own name or something else. And I was thinking, you know, if you get a band name, what if it's, you know, in the long run, what if you're not always happy with it kind of thing. Um, and I thought, because this is a solo project, I would prefer to have all of my music out under one entity. But, you know, as I said, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to, you know, pick a band name that 10 years from now doesn't resonate with me or use my name. So I kind of went with Cape Emote because it's an anagram of my name. So I was like, you know, I can kind of have it both ways. It is it is technically my name, but just in a very abstract way. Oh, cool. So when I checked your music out, I was immediately glued to the speaker. I, I just, I, I was quite swept away. Like I was. Oh, thank you. Actually, I'm going to do a proper review. Just let everyone know I'm going to have a link there. Tell me a little about this album that, you've, that you're releasing or is it already out? It is out now, yeah. So it came out in July, 14th of July. So it's been out for a little while. It's going quite well. I kind of started writing music semi-seriously maybe three or four years ago. Before that, I've been playing guitar for like 12 or 13 years, but not ever, you know, seriously trying to compose anything. Um, and then two or three years ago, I made the very late discovery of a door on a laptop and was like, okay, so it's reasonably inexpensive to write and record music now. So I'm just going to have a crack. I uh, didn't really think that far ahead in terms of how I wanted to present it or kind of what kind of music I wanted to write. I just kind of, you know, delved into it and got, got obsessed with it and was working on it all the time. And then maybe a year, a year and a half ago, I kind of went, all right, Maybe I should actually, you know, get a couple of songs and put it out seriously. So was starting to think about, you know, the what to the artist name to put it under and the, you know, the EP slash album name and the art and all that. And it kind of just organically grew over the last year and a half or so until eventually I was like, All right, let's let's just do it. Let's put something out and see what happens. Hmm. So is it turning out the way you envisioned or was it really you were just sort of exploring to see what happens? It was definitely more of an exploratory process. I don't know. I was finding it. There was lots of little things that I wanted to follow, lots of different directions I wanted to go in. And it, and I kind of just did that and did that and did that. You know, I kind of got to a point where I was like, I've got lots of stuff, but I should probably try and condense it, you know, and put something out. And so I actually got, do you know the guitarist James Avani? No. No, he's an Australian guitarist in the prog scene. He's been around for a while. He's a legendary dude. Um, he's a very good composer, guitarist, but also like a producer as well. And he does a lot of, um, I guess you would call it like musical coaching slash directing. So I've been working with him for about a year and a half. And when I went to him, I was basically like, you know, I've got a couple of songs. I have no idea how to record properly. I've got no idea how to, you know, do MIDI properly because a lot of the a lot of the EP has got MIDI instruments. So the drums are programmed, bass is programmed, a bit of violins and that kind of thing. Um, and I just needed someone to help me kind of steer me down a path. And so he helped me kind of, you know, shift mindset from just full on exploring, you know, to the end of the world to being like, right, let's try and think of how we can present what you've got now in a nice little neat package. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, in a way, I guess it did end up the way that I thought it would, but it was kind of just like roll the ball until eventually it kind of becomes something. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, uh, have you uh, performed uh, live? Are you uh, in a, do you have a band or what's your history as far as live performance? For Cape and Moat, I have not performed live. I would love to perform live starting next year. So I've got a couple more songs I'm working on at the moment, which hopefully will be out middle to end of next year and then I'll start thinking about touring that stuff but I'm in another band as well another Adelaide band called The Slow Light which is kind of like a psychedelic prog 
uh, rock band, a bit more leaning towards like the old school 70s style prog. We've just put out an album called Liminal, which is just a big album. We debuted vocals on that album as well. So we had an EP out before that, which was instrumental. And this new album has got vocals. And so we're starting to tour, sorry, not tour, play some shows in Adelaide, hopefully the beginning of next year. Um, and we've been playing on and off for, I think, first show was probably 2018. So four-ish years, but quite irregularly, maybe two, three times a year. But we're just starting to ramp that up now, which is cool. So I've got a little bit of live experience, but it's quite, yeah, irregular. Now, what's the music scene like in Adelaide? There's actually a really good music scene in Adelaide. Yeah, especially, um, so I'm quite into like the, there's quite a good like death metal scene or just metal in general. Yeah, a lot of really, really great bands coming out of Adelaide. There's a band called Freedom of Fear who are, they're a death metal band. They've just put out their album Carpathia, which is really cool. And there was a gig on the weekend um, where they were headlining, it was the album launch. And um, before them was a band called Decidia who, who are, I think they're probably the biggest prog band in Adelaide. They're a great band too. And Matt and Corey, the guitarists in Freedom of Fear and also Corey's in Decidia are just really, really, really good guitar players, like top, top notch, world-class guitar players. And so from that perspective, the scene's great. And we get, um, there's big crowds that come out too. So yeah, the metal scene's really cool. I know that there's a pretty big jazz scene as well, but I'm not necessarily that into that scene, yeah. This is your solo project, would you say this album, or is it is it is more yeah. to it? This is your solo it project. Is, yeah. yeah, it is a solo project, but I mean in for for future releases, I'm thinking about I'm not too sure how I want to divvy up the songwriting, but I do know that for things like drums, you know, I think I've done the whole the whole programmed drums thing now. I kind of want to get someone else into, you know, <laughs> do some proper drums for me because I don't really know what I'm doing with that stuff. Um, James helped me out quite a lot, but I think, you know, getting some, getting a real drummer in there just kind of brings it to another level. So I think whilst I probably maintain most of the, you know, songwriting and arranging, I do intend on bringing people in for, you know, providing their own skill set where in areas that I just, I definitely am not skilled in. Cause I think, you know, it's great to be a solo artist, but everyone's got blind spots. And, you know, I think if you can bring people in to fill those, those areas it's only going to elevate the music more you know right right now your producer his name is james what was it ivanyi he's a progressive guy so he's got oh, okay. a couple of uh albums and eps out as a like instrumental prog thing he's also done he just did an acoustic album and a synth like a synthy album this year which is cool but he's been involved in the metal and the prog scene for i want to say like 15 years maybe yeah, oh, okay. so he's been down. He's been down the road. So, good, right. um, good person to kind of mentor you. Um, right. Yeah, I'm a big fan of guitarists who are songwriters. You know, like if we're going to talk about Prague, I think uh, Alex Lifeson is one of my favorite in Rush. And yeah. um, so the the marriage between uh, songwriting and performing as a guitarist is really, uh, uh, I, I love that. I just I think that's great. Mm. Um, I give you a big thumbs up for as a songwriter. I think you've got so much uh, talent there. That's great. Oh, thank you very much. And I, yeah, I agree. I mean, to be honest, it's partially because I can't shred at all. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's there's plenty of people that can do that stuff far better than me. But I think um, from a, a songwriting perspective, I can really appreciate the shreddy stuff. But what I'm drawn to listening to has always been, like I do listen to a lot of metal, but I also listen to a lot of indie rock um, and a lot of pop and stuff too. And so I think when it comes to the more, I guess, like abstracty, proggy kind of thing, I think the people that um, well, you can see based on, you know, who's got a, a good following, it's all in the, they're not necessarily overly flashy for the sake of flashy, that there's some really, really good songwriting happening. Um, a perfect example of that is, I'm not sure if you know the guitarist Pliny. Oh, yes, I know Pliny. Or, <laughs> yeah, Pliny or... Um, yeah. There's a guy called David Maximicic, I think his name is from, I think he's from Serbia. Um, they're both, you know, as you said, you know, Pliny, um, yeah. have the technical chops. Oh, but yeah. That's not necessarily the reason that people are drawn to that music, I think. I think there's right. a level of 
intricate songwriting there that draws the listener in. And then yeah. once you've got that foundation, on top of it, you can spread in some stuff for the guitar nerds. But yeah. I think primarily <laughs> what makes the songs good is um, uh, more of a, a focus on, you know, cohesive pieces rather than, you know, being flashy. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, plenty. He has a, a pretty strong jazz uh undercurrent mm. in some of his songs that i've heard i've only reacted to a few of his songs but uh i could tell right away uh he's he's very established as a uh songwriter and uh distinct kind of style that he has what so songs uh, have you oh you go um off the top of my head i couldn't tell you i would have to google it and find out let me just <laughs> hold on here uh, yeah you know i've reacted to almost 700 songs now can you believe it yeah i was scrolling through youtube the other day there's a there's a lot on there handmade cities live and the other yeah. the other i didn't put it in the title that's bad i'll have to go correct that two years ago i did that two years um, ago yeah well electric sunrise by Pliny. yeah oh yeah those yeah. are two pretty pretty big ones right yeah. right but i think it's a really interesting genre and i'm actually going to do a lot more ex exploration on this i think you are a good example of instrumental guitar players who are doing projects or at least albums that are just focusing on the guitar as an instrument you're incorporating you know a lot i would call a lot of the modern tones of of uh distorted guitar for example i grew mm. up i grew up i was a teenager in the 80s i was really into the 70s prog at the time and yeah. it wasn't really until into the 90s where uh, Dream Theater, for example, started to incorporate the, so the, uh, a new modern distorted te texture to, to guitar. Yeah, and yeah. and Haken is a great example. Of, that's a band I've just been getting into. Oh, yeah. Haken uh, is sick. Yeah. It's just interesting to watch the evolution of guitar go from you know, one extreme to another, you know, what's next? <laughs> what's a, what's next on the horizon? <laughs> well, that's the thing. And I think like prog's a cool example because prog's been around for ages, but there's been so many different renditions of what is kind of considered prog. And I think because of the internet, because of all these little niches that you can get into, it's almost becoming, it's becoming more convoluted what prog actually is and how you define it. Because back in the seventies until now, it's quite different. But then even if you think about what is next, I think there's going to be so many different avenues that people go down. Like I've seen a lot of crossover with um, prog and like electronic music, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. People are obviously in the last sort of 10 years, well, forever, but there's been quite a heavy influence, like jazz influence in prog. So bands like um, neoclassical, like Yngwie Malmsteen from back in the day. But oh, yeah. I'm jo I can't remember the the word, but like a band like, do you know Polyphia at all? Polyphia, yes, yes. Yeah, so our Neo Soul, that's what I'm getting at. So there's kind of, you know, you have prog as a base and then people are adding in all these other elements that right. I think it's a really exciting time to be getting into prog, for sure. I, I agree. Um I've also been getting into a lot of the Japanese music scene and uh, oh, have you? something that's very unique about uh, that scene is the amount of female bands, you know, like baby metal, uh, band yeah. made love bites, uh, Nemophilia, Hanabi. And mm -hmm. uh, that's just, that's just a few of them. Asterism is an incredible amount of new fresh music, which is kind of bringing back the music that I sort of, that I can relate to as someone who grew up mm. in, the, in the decades that I did, because it felt like uh, in the nineties, we had grunge and we had um, yeah that, but that was sort of the last thing that happened in rock. And then it just all fell off a cliff in the two thousands. <laughs> and that, I mean, obviously there's been prog bands, there's been little pockets of activity going on pretty strongly. Actually, I was surprised how much is going on and, and metal has become such an interesting genre and, and how that's blended with prog and uh and then electronic and yeah. it's getting interesting now there's this, there's this, I, it feels like there's something brewing and um do you watch a lot of react videos i do yeah especially when like an album comes out that i find like i i like it i like to see what other people think of it too and it's kind of for that reason as well because i think there's so much that happens in newer music where you hear a song and you go whoa because pr production techniques and all that are kind of improving as more and more people it's becoming more accessible so more and more people can have access to experimenting and stuff like that um so i think yeah reaction videos are great for that not only for introducing yourself to new music but also kind of just seeing that 
there's acknowledgement from other people that are like, wow, this is really exciting. So I, I totally agree with you that it's a great time for music. Pop music, on the other hand, is such a, a wasteland. I don't know. How do you feel about the whole pop pop music scene? Yeah, it's extremely yeah. commercial. It's a money-making machine. Yeah. Um, I think that there are some artists in there that are doing cool things, though, as well. Mm -hmm. um, people like Dua Lipa is a good example. Um, Billie Eilish has got some cool stuff out. Will Smith's daughter, Willow Smith, she's got some cool stuff cranking. Oh, really? Um, yeah, the new Adele album is pretty good. Mm -hmm. So I think that in general, yes, pop is like, it's a money-making machine, right? But yeah. there's also a lot of, if you're creative, Sia as well is a good example, if you know Sia, of some poppy artists that are pushing the boundaries. And I think that there's a lot that you can learn because there is so much money in pop. There's a lot that you can learn as an observer of the scene um, of kind of, you know, production techniques and stuff. But generally speaking, I do agree that it's quite mm. commercialised. And I do wonder, um, prog as a genre takes a lot of attention span and patience to listen to, you know? Um, and I think that one thing that pop is quite good at is it's very quick, you know? And so people are like, you know, if it's two and a half, three minute song, and if you're not interested in the first five seconds, you skip it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I do wonder how that's going to look in the future with music because, you know, prog songs with two minute intros. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes music inspires, inspires people to take up an instrument. For example, Neil, Neil Peart of Rush. I mean, just yeah. imagine how many people took up drums just because mm. they heard Rush and they thought that drummer's a amazing i've got to get it and for me it's a similar thing um i don't know if you know tubular bells by mike oldfield you know that 70s prog album no i don't i should probably oh, check okay. it out though well he was a pioneer in the sense that he was a single musician who basically recorded mm. an entire album using 60 tracks and this is back in the days of tape when you go back and forth recording on the same tape where you ha you actually the tape get gets stretched and it and it could actually break. I mean, it was it was amazing that Whoa. now it, we could do it on a computer easily. I could do it my yeah, MacBook, yeah, yeah. sixty track, bitty tracks, whatever. But he did it back in seventy two or seventy three. They took a big chance. Virgin was a new label at the time, and mm. Richard Branson ran that label, and he released this instrumental album, which which is yeah. this one song with part one, part two, and became yeah. a multi million seller. And wow. uh, in the seventies, prog sold. Mm. It was selling a lot of uh, albums. All these albums were closely edged by Yes, sold gold, and so is an interesting. Yes, Genesis. It's such an interesting time for music, King Crimson. And um, mm. so as somebody who loves all that kind of music myself, when I hear your music, to me, that is like the bubbling up of something great again. Like I, I see something, this is the beginning of a new movement. And, and like I mentioned, Adarsh, there's another guitarist too, um, Canadian guy, what was his name? Again, Canadian Morgan was his name, but I'm going to be interviewing, you know, a lot of guitarists. And yeah. because I see this... Uh, this is going to inspire a lot of people to take up the instrument. You know, it's going to actually feed into that whole idea mm. of, hey, I'd like to play guitar too. That sounds great. Rather than hearing yeah. something someone did on their computer with a couple of blip-blop bloops, you know? I yeah, mean, I, yeah, mean yeah. I, I mean, there's an art to that too, and, and it's creative, but uh, but there's nothing that beats just practicing your instrument. Uh, how, how often, I mean, it's probably hard for you to get time in for practice, is it? I am I am notoriously bad at practicing. I think, yeah, as I said before, I've probably been playing guitar for maybe 12 years. You know, I, I grew up listening to Metallica. So Metallica is the reason I started playing guitar. And their songs are really complicated, but they're kind of like if you if you stumble across the right song first, like if you stumble across Enter Sandman first, you could learn that pretty quickly. And so I and then you keep going and then you get more technical songs like I'm not too sure how familiar you are with Metallica, but their song Dyer's Eve is, I think, probably their hardest song to play. But if you kind of, as I was starting to learn guitar, I was literally just learning Metallica songs. And so you start with a song like Into Sandman, which is pretty easy. 
keep going, keep going, keep going until you've got the whole way through their catalogue and you're, you know, a competent guitarist. Um, so, but in general, like practising, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I've, you know, been quite lazy at it. Um, <laughs> but just to go back to your point about, about prog back in the 70s and coming up now and bubbling and all that, I think the other thing is that, so I came from the metal background. I grew up listening to Metallica on the internet, watching James Hetfield, you know, 1989 Seattle, gone ape shit, looks, you know, mm-hmm. looks really cool. I'm like, I want to do that. But then someone else that's my age might be looking at someone from the seventies, you know, up on stage might be looking at Pink Floyd going, wow, that's sick. Or, you know, someone might be looking at um, Pliny going, that's sick. I want to do that. And so that's why I think there's such a, definitely in the last 10 years, I've noticed that kind of bubbling and coming up. It's coming from a lot of different places. So you get a lot of different kinds of music, but it also means that, back to your point about practicing people are exposed to all of these different players John Petrucci is an amazing guitarist in dream theater and if you see that guy on the internet when you're growing up you're going to want to and you become attached to it you're going to want to practice and become like that you know and so I think it's really pushing the boundaries to become great at you know any instrument really Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how old were you when you started playing guitar I'm 25 now, so probably 12 or 13. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's great. It's a good age to do it because when you're young, you don't have all of the uh, distractions. Well, I don't know. Maybe nowadays it's different, but I, I seem to, you know, I came home from school and I could just go straight to my room. I didn't have to make supper for anybody. I yeah, could just yeah, yeah, yeah. play yeah. and learn, figure out some songs off a record yeah. or whatever. And, uh, and, yeah. uh, and then it stays with you for life. Uh, it's probably oh, the yeah. same. It's probably the same with learning a language. If you learn it when you're really young, when you get older, you can just sort of draw on it at any point you need it, and, just, and it's sort of there, it's sort of stored away. That's so, the thing. Yeah, it's good I, to um, start young. I definitely encourage anyone to learn at any age, anyway. But I, I think learning yeah. an instrument is a great thing to do. And even for me, like I, um, guitar wasn't my first instrument. I started on violin, and I think that actually helped me when it came time to learn guitar, anyway. But I kind of drifted away from guitar when I was about 18 was doing other things and I only really came back to it because I kind of got interested in this like new modern prog scene thing a couple of years ago and so that's to your point like it stays with you for life so I learned it when I was a kid and then I moved away from it and now I'm just I'm coming I'm coming back to it you know yeah yeah do you ever think Mm -hmm. you'll pick up a violin again (laughs) <laughs> oh i would love to i yeah. don't know how much violins cost i'm assuming that they're quite expensive and i also think that i would probably suck at it you know violins are if you're bad at violin it's it's not fun if you're bad at guitar it's okay if you're bad at violin like everyone's oh my ears hurt right. <laughs> <laughs> well, i would love i would love to though just to get um some violin parts on like proper violin parts on some songs that'd be sick yeah because uh, I just think of uh, I don't know if you've heard of UK the band called UK um, they have a they had a violinist his name was Eddie Jobson and he also yeah. played the keyboards and uh, he could play he was I guess one of the earlier uh, you know prog violinists who would mm. go through an amp it was a lot of, it was actually a plexiglass violin he played on it was quite new at the time 1979 oh, yeah. so yeah. you could see through it and it was electronic yeah, yeah. and he'd plug it into amps and he'd put on phasers and distortion pedals and stuff like that so that was a really new sound well definitely there's a, a possibility there if you ever did get into violin again that'd be kind of cool you, sh- you should check out neo Pliviscaris if you haven't yet have you heard oh of it? yes yes i've racked it to yeah. a couple of songs so they've got a couple of songs with violin on it as well and they're australian aren't they they are, yeah. So yeah, they've yeah. got two singers. I can't remember the dude's name. It's Tim. I wish I could remember his name, but he's the the uh, like clean vocalist, and he also plays violin. And I've seen him live. It's really, really cool. Yeah, because they're, they're quite heavy prog. Yeah, quite mm-hmm. cool band. Would anything else you wanted to bring up uh, before we wrap it up? Certainly, I'll put your links below. I'll have the review there. I'll, that'll be linked up there. I'm going to review your album properly. And uh... I think just um, check out the Slow Light album if you haven't already. And also stay tuned because I'm doing a new music video in a couple of weeks. So Great. that should be out uh, start of next year. I think it's going to be really cool. We're doing 
a weird thing with a green screen and then there's going to be all these lights that are kind of dancing around, pulsating around the drums and all that. So it should be quite cool. Sounds great. That's another great thing about uh, YouTube, for example, how a lot of bands now, if you're independent, you can go and produce a video. You know, you could pour a few dollars into it if you want it to be mm. high production value and and uh, people will watch it. This is great. It's, yeah. it's there. People check it out. Yeah, the video I did before is quite well received so it's good to know yeah i enjoyed uh i remember one of them you, uh you were it had a nice set there was like a sort of uh, some furniture yeah. with some sort of props kind of things they're kind of cool it reminded me of opeth or something maybe oh yeah with the old kind of dimly lit stuff yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's another great bet. Okay, well, thanks a lot for this interview and uh, all the best to you. And hopefully we'll, we'll keep in touch. Maybe if something else happens with you, uh, we can do some more further conversations in the future. For sure. Cheers, Dean. Thanks. For okay, me. cheers. Take care. Cheers. Bye.